Welcome back to Locus Classicus Podcast. I'm joined today by my host, Michael Brown, and I'm Will Cravels. And today we're very lucky to have in studio, in the Locus Classicus Podcast studio with us, Alan Soar. Um, Alan Soar is a good friend of ours, and he's going to um, be here today to bless us with all of his knowledge. And uh, what are we going to be talking about today, guys? Well, I think I think first off, just uh, Alan, can you give us a little bit of an introduction to some of the things that you've worked on? Because uh, it's yeah. a bit of an extensive list, if I do say so, and it keeps getting longer and longer. Oh God! <laughs> uh, first <laughs> of all, I don't, I don't, I never feel like I'm an expert. I'm just like a, uh, I don't know. I always feel like I'm an amateur who likes to read a lot, and somehow I just uh, have the fortune to be involved with. A number of projects and so uh, I was involved with uh, Mike uh, he had a translation of the Johansson's uh, examination of Chinosum points and so I worked with him on that as an editor and I also worked with Johan Hausen on his various Taoist uh, commentary uh, sometimes I serve as a coach translator sometimes as an editor and also I translated parts of uh, Complete Compendium by Zhang Jiyue, uh, which I I was the main translator, and, and also with, during which uh, Michael also served as a editor. And lately, I, I also work with uh, Professor Huang Huang in his newest uh, bilingual manual, or his uh, Jinghuang clinical manual. So, yeah, <laughs> it, I, I feel like it's a lot of work, and I have no life. And uh, <laughs> besides translating, I read books. <laughs> that's, and that's pretty well, much it. Well, besides translating, you, you've done some teaching as well. Yeah. I. And, and what are your areas that you specialize in teaching? Because I think that is actually relevant to our uh, discussion on the podcast today. Mm -hmm. If not so, more relevant than your translations. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm currently serving as a DAOM faculty at ACCHS. Uh, a program started by Phil Settles. And it's actually very fortunate for me that uh, well gave me the freedom to teach what I feel most interested about in my field of study, which is the history aspect of the medicine. Like, because one thing about the history of medicine is that we get bits and pieces of a lot of legends. But how do you connect them together? How do you tell one, how does one thought leads to another? How, why did the reformation come about? Why did people propose new ideas? So that, that would be my field of interest. So at CCHS, I teach about textual history of canonical texts such as the Neijin and also the Shanghanlun and Jingguo Yaolir. And also I talk about how Shanghanlun became a class of its own in the 11th century and how it developed throughout from the 11th century to the late mm. 19th century to the Jingfang as we know it today. So those are kind of my specialty. Just kind of want to, because I possibly, it is my background as a scientist and as an engineer. When I see certain phenomena from when they appear, I want to be able to explain why is it that they appear. And so that's that's something I feel like that's uh, missing quite a bit in our uh, in our uh, academia and also in 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 the professional side, because I, I feel like people focus so much on the events, but they don't really look into the circumstances and also the events that lead to its arising. And because from what we see, we only see a snapshots, but we don't see the whole picture. So that so I would say that would be my uh, primary uh, interest in terms of research and reading. Yeah, and <clears throat> often when we're uh, confused on any sort of uh, textual issue or historical issue, we just have to give Alan a little shout out and um, we get the, <laughs> we get long, long explanations far, far beyond what we could ever have wanted <laughs> or imagined. So um, Alan's been instrumental for me also in sort of uh, teaching me up, educating me on a lot of on a lot of this stuff. 
Um, so we're excited to have Alan on for sure, you know, just to, to share all, all this knowledge. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll have you on a couple of times um, because obviously one, one podcast is not going to be enough. Um, but, but in any case, um, shall we move into the, uh, what we're going to talk about today? I, I think so. It's a, it's a pretty interesting topic, I think. One that has uh, gained a fair bit of interest in the last couple of years, particularly here in the West. So our topic today is none other than the illustrious Fushing Dre. Oh, God. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of a controversial text, would you, would you guys say? Uh, for quite, quite a number of reasons. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, in, in the Chinese circle. It, that text has been there for a while. I think it first appeared in like 1989. When... I, thought, I thought the 70s, but what, are you saying later than that? Well, the publication th- of Maji's yeah, pub- text came in. The yeah, publication, yeah, uh... came much later with Maji Xin's publication. So, so mm-hmm. was it was that like the because didn't like a group of scholars or something like that or did they get sent the text a copy of the text that do you remember how maji Xing came to be studying it so based on my uh based on what i recall so the the text when maji Xing first interviewed the two people uh basically uh the the disciples of zhang da chuan uh zhang da chang and right. mm-hmm. there were it, do you just want to give us a quick introduction about well, who Zhang Da Chang was? Or well, even what the Fu Xing Zhe is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we kind of just are. dived in. <laughs> so okay, so so let's let's give a huge overview. Okay, Fu Xing Zhe is this very interesting text uh, in which it claims to have been the writing by Tao Hong Jin, or some people argue to be a writing by Tao Hong Jin's disciple. So for those who don't know, Tao Hong Jin is like this Taoist in the Wei Jin dynasty who allegedly wrote the, the Shenlong Ben Zhao Jin work. He compiled the first Shenlong Ben Zhao Jin, uh, put it together, and also he wrote something called the Mini Bielu. Uh, this is about 560 CE, are we talking? Or... Yeah, some, somewhere in the 6th century yeah. uh, CE. And so, so within this text, we have the name Tao Hong Jin. And then another part that's quite fascinating is that it talks about two, well, actually, there are two things that's super fascinating. First of all, it contains formula that seems to be, to be have lost in the Shanghai Nun. So in the Shanghai Nun, we have uh, Zheng Wutang, uh, we call it true warrior decoction today. So, but the traditional name should be Shen Wutang, the black mm. tortoise decoction. And also we have Bai Wutang, which is white tiger decoction. And then we also had a major and minor Qin Hong Tang, the green dragon. So if you know enough about the four guardians, you know Zhu Chi is missing, the, the fire phoenix or yep. the Vernerian bird is missing. And so throughout history, we do have recording elsewhere, like Wai Tai Miao, we do have a Zhu Chi Tang Yin, Wai Tai Miao, which is uh, today's Shi Zao Tang, the 10 days decoction. Yeah. And so, but, this is this has been something that's always fascinates uh, Shanghai Nun practitioners and scholars throughout the past like I don't know one thousand years. People just always want to figure out like, okay, the text of Shanghai Nun we have today is incomplete. Where is the rest of the thing? So, so when this text appears, it seems to show one answer to those uh, millennia questions. Is basically we do have Zhu Chetang, we have Da Zhu Chetang and uh, Xiao Zhu Chetang. The, the big Zhu Chui Tang, is, uh, the small Zhu Chui Tang, I remember correctly, if I remember is correctly, it... is Huang Lei e Jiao Tang. Yeah, that's correct. And the Da Zhu Chui Tang from Fu Xing Jie is uh, Huang Lei e Jiao Tang with the addition of Ren Shen and something else. So so basically it completes the picture. So it makes the Shanghai Nun people really super fascinated. And the other thing is, uh, if you read a little bit about history of Shanghai Nun and also especially if you believe in a traditional perspective of textual transmission, that you would definitely see the work of Fu Xingjie. You would definitely treat it as a huge deal because within Fu Xingjie, you have something called Tang Ye Jing. So in one portion of Fu Xingjie, you have 25 herbs. And 
which is divided based on their uh, their flavor and also by their you can say the elemental affinity kind of so organ have, or element as well right yeah so you had a wood herb and the wood 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 herb yep. and the metal wood herb etc so you have 25 herbs that represent so, kind of phase within the phase right is yeah, what they're looking at correct so so you have those like you can say the quintessential herbs were with each elements and also the within interaction with the, the elements so so that's that is so alone is fascinating, but the more fascinating part is the very word Tang Ye Qi. So based on uh, the the history, or I, let, let me call it the traditional perspective of the Chinese medical history, because right now the traditional perspective or the traditional ideas about how Chinese medicine came to be came mostly from one passage, one actually one single passage. That passage is found in the preface of Huang Fu Mi's Zhen Zhou Jia Yi Jin. So uh, in English, it's systematic canon of acupuncture and muscle passion. So I'm not preface. And that, that's about third century uh, that is stated to? Thereabouts? If you believe Huang Fu Mi wrote it, then it's third century. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so could it, could it be, could, do you think it could be earlier or later? I believe it's later. Okay. Wow. I, I, I don't think it's, it's Huang Fu Mi wrote it. Okay. And but anyhow, <laughs> so assuming we believe that that perspective, so it would say that the Chinese medicine came to be from the yellow, the Shenong yellow pair, and so so from the gel, so there are two major transmissions. So one is the herbal side, one is the acupuncture side. So for acupuncture side, we we had the yellow pair, Qi Bo, Bo Gao, and Shao Shi Shao Yu. All those people had those discussion, and they wrote down something, and then it was passed down to Lei Gong. And they gonna pass it down to other people later, um, and then be a chair got a part of it, and then it was transmitted throughout history down to our time. So that's the acupuncture part. But on the herbal part, you have uh, you have Shenlong first, who tasted the herbs to understand the nature of each medicinal. Then afterwards, you have Ian, who, based on the knowledge of Shenlong, he then put those herbs together into decoction. And he later on passed out this knowledge to all the people. And based on Huang Fu Mi's uh, writing, he said that Zhang Jingyue picked up on Yi Yin's Tang Ye. So based on the knowledge uh, of Yi Yin's Tang Ye, so some people say it's Tang Ye Jing. And then he wrote something else. He, or he elaborated or commented on it. And that became his writing. And so in... Can I just ask, Alan, yeah. with Yi Yin... Was he, he wasn't just seen, I guess, like has making medicinal decoctions, but also like cuisine as well. Is he sort of seen has like a bit of kind of like you know the grandfather of like the Chinese cooking or? Yeah, so yeah. I think yeah. it's it based it's based on the legends because uh, so for those who don't know, uh, Ian he was a uh, he was a uh, nobility towards the end of the Xia Dynasty. So Xia Dynasty is like a, I don't know. It's like, 1500, 1600 years BCE. Mm. So it was, it's yeah. like three, four thousand years I, I, from now. Yeah, I think, and, I think, I think, because that the, 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 what is it, the Zhou yeah. comes after that about fifth, and that's about 15 to 750. So I think Xia is about. Yeah, so you have Xia Dynasty, Shang Dynasty, and the Zhou Dynasty. Then the uh, Zhou Dynasty is split into the spring, autumn, and then yeah. Warren States, and then you had Han Dynasty. That, those yeah. are the easy breakup. So yeah. Uh, so uh, Ian is like this uh, nobility who is actually, he, I think he, he was first a nobility, but then he, according to legends, he committed certain crime, or maybe the king just hated him. And so he was banished and became a slave. And wow, I didn't know when that. he was a slave, he befriended one nobility. That nobility, his name is Tang. So, and, and he got close to this nobility by his cooking. So that's why people say that he is like the founder of cooking because that because it, based on the lore or the legend, it was really he was very well known for his cooking skill. And also the other thing is uh well if you're good at cooking, guess what else you can do? Medicine. So those are the historical roots from that speculation. So based on the back to let's go back to Huang Fumi. So Huang Fumi wrote this and he said that well Yi was the guy who put together the herbs 
because he he he's a chef. He needs to know his ingredients. He wants to he needed to know how to make things taste good, and uh, be uh, that's pretty that uh, works for your health as well. So then he put there in production, and Zhang Zhongyi inherited his idea or his writing or whatever, and then created something. And according to uh, Huang Fengyi, then what he created is likely called the Shanghai Zafinun we have today. So that's a short history based on the traditional perspective. So what are the problems with using Huang Fumi's preface to justify, I guess, this kind of, how do you say, transmission? Uh, so there are a lot of issues. <laughs> so, <laughs> what so what, what issues would you say, one or, two, one or two prominent issues, just to, to kind of pick apart uh, this, this issue of transmission? So, so, so first of all, uh, do we even know the Yellow Imperial and Shenlong existed? And the question, the answer is no. <laughs> they did not exist until 4th century BCE. <laughs> yep. So, so <laughs> the first question is like the, the root of the, the source of transmission is already broken up. And second of, if we um, look into the historical development of medicine, so to speak, so uh, you. Well, well I, I was more just talking about Huang Fumi's kind of preface a little bit about. Yeah, it's just how... like his claim is based on legends and mythology. Mm. Okay. It, it's yeah. not, he doesn't really have good evidence of that. And also, it's not only in the modern time we suspect something's wrong with it, because during the Song Dynasty, we have a lot of scholars uh, having issue with this claim as well. Like uh, Chen Hao had an issue with it, Sima Guang has had the issue with it, and also the other guy, uh, I don't remember his name. So basically, he's a, he's a founder of the Xiang Su Zong of the Neo-Confucian school. He also had issue with that. So basically, all the biggest scholar at the time during the Song Dynasty had issue with this claim because they, they read the text and said, dude, this, based on the writing, the style, the grammar and, and terminology, it had to be Warring States era. Mm -hmm. And there's no way Yellow Imperial wrote this. So, uh, so when we, like, Huang Fu Mi made those claims about the transmission, then we can check with a lot of things. Uh, first of all, what, what are evidence? What, what is the writing? Like, What's a recording of uh, medicine from all the different sources, non-medical sources, and then just examine against the evidence, and it quickly comes to realize it's it that claim is like a fantasy. And the other thing is, um, the, the, there are just know. a few, sorry, I was going to say there are a couple of sources of kind of like discussion of me medicine around that period of time as well in the Warring States. Yeah, you, you have what? Well, not quite Ma Wang Dui, but some people might argue it because it was sealed about what, like one one seventy, one sixty. Yeah, Ma Wang Dui. It's it's uh, from the Western Han Dynasty, so it's yeah, a but, little bit later. But um, but it was sealed, so possibly the writings could have been done prior to Han, but yeah, because it was sealed. You also have what the Lao Guan Shan scrolls, uh, and they were about two thirty, were they? That one, I do not know the dating, but okay. I think it's Western but, Han. Oh, and as well. Okay. So the, we, so when I talk about non-medical source, I was talking about Zhou Zhuan. Like oh, the well, and, then, Zimin, and, you know, and, so. and those are the medical cases by, is it Yi Chun Li? So who's the? Uh, the Chang Gong. So that's uh, in Shiji. Uh, so okay. Shiji is in, uh, I think it's 56 C BC. Those are yeah, a little bit yeah. later. So what I'm more interested about is like, what are the medical writing records that predated the Han Dynasty? And we do have those records. Like, mm. like what I mentioned earlier, we had Zhou Zhuan, the, mm. the Chronicles of Zimin, and also we have Guori. So those are written in the late Warring States era. So like the third, fourth century BCE. So those predated even the Han Dynasty records of that. And, and from that, we actually do see something quite fascinating is that we see a uh, medicine evolving from divination into natural based science. And so, so basically uh, one of the most famous story is uh, Zhou Zhuan, and I think everyone cited this and it has been cited to death is uh, Qing Yi He. So uh, we, we say that he's uh, the medical attendant, his name is He. And so basically he visited the king of the time and the king was sick. And everyone's like, oh, you are a well-known 
diviner, please make divination so we can see the outcome of the king's health. And what, what sacrifice do we need to make in order to make the king better? And that attendant, uh, he declined. He declined to make a divination. Instead, he's like, well, you actually, you had to look into uh, the thunder, the wind, the cold, the heat. And also you need to check in the indulgence with alcohol, with sexual uh, uh, lust and all, all that stuff in order to dictate the health of the king. You, if you only trust by on the divination, then it will not actually bring a resolution of his disease. So so we do see that record in Zuo Zhuan. But, so, so, but, so we see almost a change from, yeah, kind of like relying on maybe, yeah, the heaven movements to kind of more looking at the person, looking at the, perhaps the geography of where yeah. they are, their current climate, yeah. Yeah. which is kind of, you definitely see that Lot, a, a lot in the in the Huang De Neijing, yeah, yeah. I, because Huang De Neijing is based on that those ideas. Because Huang mm. De Neijing didn't tell you to divine or mm. outcome of the disease. They didn't right. tell you to make sacrifices. And yeah. then, uh, so those are because if you really dig up like uh, oracle bonds, that's those are the things that the the record from Zuo Zhuan, uh, from the attendant he he rejected because uh, those were the you can say the old medicine. The front front time period, and they say now we need to look into this person. What does the person have? What is the condition of this person based on the climate, the external factor, and also the lifestyle of the person? And actually, that record, I would suggest everyone to read the book by Miranda Brown because even that record is problematic. <laughs> I I do not think it's an accurate portrayal of history. I I think it's a because it's, it's, the book is Art of Medicine, is it? Yeah, uh, I don't have her book with me right now. I think it's called uh, Medical Art of Early China, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, something Art Medicine, but Miranda Brown is... Yeah, I uh, highly recommend people to check check out that book because uh, because Qing Yihe, based on her analysis, uh, it's actually the name. It's more like a... It's actually someone else. It's actually Yan Zi. From, from the other kingdom, from Qi kingdom. And because he made a very, very similar claim, but he, uh, the, 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 the reason why he made this, the claim is not because of medical nature, it's more like political stuff. So uh, oh. it's a very complicated stuff. So yeah, go yeah, read her book. Yeah. In any <laughs> case, um, just to circle back in here. So when we're talking about the Fu Xingjie, um, there's sort of like two levels of claims, right? We um, People are, are very interested in Fu Xingzhi, um, both in the East and the West. Um, it's become a, a major, a, a huge topic of scholarship in China because of um, how it's been espoused by sort of like the, the upper echelons of mm -hmm. the Jingfang world. When we talk about someone like Wu Xishu and Feng Shilun, um, and before them, these scholars who gave it their blessing, um, these top, top notch scholars in China mm -hmm. in, in Ma Jixing and Chen Caochen, and um, another guy, something you something. Um, and uh, so so it's a it's a very important book to talk about. And in the West, there are also um, certain schools that that really almost rely on it to a degree. And so the question of its um, reliability as as a text that came prior to or or gives a, or essentially was formulated around the time of um, the Shanghan Lun influenced the Shanghan Lun according to these people um, and so is this very very important insight into the Shanghan Lun itself but the problem is that um, people find issues along the way. We just talked about the first issue, um, which has to do with the Tangyi Jingfa. So what, what happened was, um, people will say that uh, the Fu Xingjie was written by Tao Jing or by uh, his disciples, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then what they say is, well, these people had access to mm -hmm. the Tangyi Jingfa, right? Yeah. And, so, and so as a result, the Fu Xingjie it contains pieces of the Tangyi Jingfa, which then people say had a very, very direct impact on the Shanghan Lun. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And so what Alan was just talking about, because because sometimes, you know, you got you guys are just so um, kind of fluent in this stuff that 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 people can get lost. But um, is just that you really have to call into question if the tongue Jing, the tongue Jing Fa even really did have an impact on the Song mm-hmm. Han Right. Mm-hmm. And that was the that was the point that was just being made essentially. Um, the problem being that the only record we have of there being some connection comes from this Huang Fumi in yep, the preface correct. to the to the Jia Jing. Mm-hmm. And um that that itself has all these problems because he seems to be drawing on mythology and mm-hmm. all and all this stuff. Um and there not if being can... really any record. Yep, go ahead. Well, I was, I was just gonna say even drawing on mythology, but but another point Alan makes is that even if we were to be, to believe kind of what he says that the the Huang Fumi preface probably wasn't written by Huang Fumi himself nor you know did he write the Jia Jing so even kind of it's not just these issues of mythology it's issues of the authorship of the of the preface itself as well and when was it written as well which is right. kind of another kind of like you know bag bag of, of worms in itself yeah it's like a because if you only have one evidence and it's a shaky one, then I, I find it just to, just highly problematic to for you to establish your claim. You know, it's like uh, yeah. we, we have this work, this title, and then this guy from this problematic text say it's a precursor to one of the most important texts in the Chinese herbal medicine. Uh, something just find I just find it to be too good to be true. And I mean, as I, as a uh, herbalist and also as a gene farm practitioner, I also want it to be true, but based on the evidence, it's just a little bit shaky, but I, I think we can talk more about that because authorship, because uh, I, I feel like authorship is a huge issue in Chinese literature in general, not, not just medical literature, just the whole thing, because a lot of time people say, oh, this text, has this guy saying this thing? So that guy must have written it, right? Most of history problematic because a lot of times people repurpose the text, and also a lot of times people write text and put down the different names on it. So, for example, um, uh, even from the Ye- Yellow Empires in a canon. So, Huang Longxiang has been doing a lot of uh, research on that because he's trying to recreate a, what's called a historical school of Bing Chen. Just uh, for those who don't know, Huang Longchang is a very famous scholar out of China, mm-hmm. discussing primarily kind of like the early history of acupuncture. Mm-hmm. Just to, yeah. yeah. So yeah. basically, there has been a we can say the one of the early, really early school of uh, acupuncture or like Chinese medicine in general. So based on his research and also all the fragments he could find from everywhere from non-medical text like Shi Ji and also the annotation to Shi Ji. Shi Ji is uh, the records of Grand historians, so one of the first major historical books written in China by the imperial government uh, dated in the first century uh, BCE. And so in those cases, we do have a lot of records of uh, who Bing Chir was and also how his disciple uh, treated people and also cited from the alleged writing or transmission of Bing Chir. And also we have later writings from, we can even find it from Sun Simiao from the post canon uh, that actually had the characteristic of the Pinchir school that matches with what's found in the non-medical text. And then we have excavation texts that also suggests the writing come from Pinchir or the transmission of Pinchir. So after he analyzed those all those texts and then he found out what, what are the common ideas like the methodology, diagnostic criteria, and things, and also philosophy to to an extent. And then he found out that a lot of the current version of the Neijing. So I think he said that 23 chapters of the Neijing are direct uh, repurposed text from the Pinchir school. But they changed the name to uh, Yellow Empire and uh, and to, and also to Qibo. But originally it came from Pinchir. So we see te- like text being repurposed and recombined together, stitched together. That's one thing. And the other thing, just like 
uh, there are two, let me bring out two more examples. So since I was, have been working on the Zhang Jingyue's translations. So uh, there's a text called Jingyue Quan Su Fa Hui. So uh, the English title is elaborating on the complete companion of Zhang Jingyue. So basically that book just try to destroy everything uh, Zhang Jingyue is good for. Is that the and, book by uh, attributed to Ye Tianshu? Yep. Yeah. So yep. Ye Tianshu never wrote it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Ucho wrote it. <laughs> Ucho, uh, Ucho wrote it. So, yeah. and how do we know? Because uh, we can compare against uh, Ye Tianzhi's writing because Ye Tianzhi actually cited from Zhang Jingyue. He was mm. for Zhang Jingyue stuff. And also the writing style is just so different from Ye Tianzhi's mm. known works. And so, also his treatment methodology. Yeah. So um, this kind of problem of perhaps authors attributing a more famous author to their to their work or to the mm -hmm. other works is kind of a problem that has never really gone away in nope. the history of Chinese it, writing. Yeah, it's still it's still the case nowadays. And uh but sometimes they do it out of respect to their teacher. Like uh yeah, so yes, yeah, so it's not a negative uh, thing. It's kind of like trying to maybe even just get a little bit more publicity to the text. Yeah, as well, sometimes right? they do do it like the so for example um uh, there's a word called, I think, Huang Di Su Wen, uh, Huang Di Yun Qi Bao Ming Ji, I think. Uh, so I don't even know how to translate that. Yellow Imperial's uh -huh. uh, movement, Qi uh, to safeguard life. So yeah. allegedly it's written by Liu Wan Su, but uh, that text, we yeah. all know it's written by Zhang Yun Su. And why is that? Why is that? Because first of all, we look into the text and we look in the content, it's like, Liu Wan Su never had those ideas. Those were the ideas by Zhang, okay. Zhang Yun Su and also later practitioner. D and, disclaimer, I didn't know that, so. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so we compare the content and the writing style and this and that, and then we, we know it's not by Liu Wan Su, but the, the, the fun part is then why did he attribute it to Liu Wan Su? Uh, because Liu Wan Su was Zhang Yun Su's teacher. So oh, he did okay. it in, in terms of honoring him. It's like, oh, I know it's because of you. So you deserve the name of the title, not me. So we, we had cases like that all throughout history in Chinese writing, even today. Like a lot of uh, famous teachers, well, they don't really write things. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, let's, let's not go, go deeper into that. I, I'll get right. trouble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so we've, we've broadly been talking about a couple of is issues. Mm -hmm. We're going to take take a small break, but we'll, what, are we, what are we going to be talking about, about when we come back from the break? Well, so we've gone into this first issue, which is about the uh, legitimacy of calling uh, the Tang Yi Jing sort of this predecessor of the Shang Han Lun. And then, of course, by extension, the Fu Xing Jia being related to the Tang Yi Jing. And so calling into question all of that legitimacy. Now, I think when we get back from the break, we can talk about the Fu Xing Jia itself. And was it actually even written by it in this the Sui dynasty and, um or uh, by Tao Hongjing or his disciples right or what how about they just go through an overview of what everyone's claim is because we we do have multiple claims we need to talk about right all right. right well yeah, let's yeah. do that all right we'll take a small break and we'll be mm -hmm. right back thank you for listening All right, welcome back. And so we were just talking about um, a lot of really complicated stuff uh, with regard to the Fu Xing Jie and all these uh, textual issues. Um, of course, you know, um, it's easy to get lost in the details, but the details are important um, because at the end of the day, what we're talking about is the legitimacy of a text, right? And mm -hmm. if we want to use this text, which has become so important to analyze um, the Shang Han Lun and talk about it being the predecessor to the Shang Han Lun and being able to give us all these insights, um, it's probably in our best interest to know if it's actually a legitimate text, right? Um, now in China, as we've been talking about, it really got sort of coronated um, in the, the late 1980s, in the 90s, because you have the the absolute um, top guy, Ma Jixing, um, in terms of scholarship, saying it's it's the real deal, right? And Chen Taochun as well, and so everyone else. So after that time, when it comes down to it, no one even really questions um, if if 
Fu Xing Jue is a legitimate text. It's just thought to be so. Is that fair to say? Would you say in China at least? Yeah, I I feel like in in China, even in China, there have been a few different claims, and even for Ma Jixin, I think in the 80s he say it's a real deal, but later on in the more recent text I read, he refuted that claim. So I would say that right now in China there are three different claims, and uh, let me let me just list them out. So let's start from the most pro claim. So the most pro claim right now I would say the banner waiver would be Qian Chaochen, and also is being propagated by uh, Feng Shilun. So they so their claim is that they believe uh, Fu. Oh. thing and that text would predate the writing of Shang Han Lun. So Shang Han Lun actually follow whatever the information in that text to and and dis, and develop it into its system uh, that we know as Shang Han Lun today. So that's a claim from Qin Chaochun. So that's a number one claim. Number two, we have the claim from I would say call it the late Ma Jixin claim. So late Ma Jixin claim, I think it has been very argued very well and very well uh, represented by uh, Sabine Wang's recent work because Sabine Wang wrote her work based on most of uh, Ma Jixin's later uh, discoveries. So Ma which, was, which, what is that work called? Uh, it's a uh, called Celestial Secrets, yeah. and I, I think it's a it's a book that's definitely worth reading. So definitely take get a copy and and read through it and. Uh, I, I think, and I don't want to talk about the nuance of the argument because I think Sabine already did a very, very good job on that. I cannot add any more to that. So back to Magician's claim. So Magician's later claim would be that this is a text written by medieval uh, practitioner. And uh, so he he further elaborated, probably he compiled different writings of Tang Ye Jin or maybe by text by Zhang Zhongjin and into this text. So it's not something that predates Shang Han Lun. It's something that's later. Maybe parts of it may be predated. He didn't say, say it, but he said it's a medieval text. So the time range would be Tang Dynasty to early Song Dynasty. So maybe like 6th century, 7th century to 10th century. So that would oh, be okay. the Ma Jixin claim uh, for his later claim. So this is claim number two. So it would be very different because before we have something that's authentic text from the high antiquity down to, from Yin down to Shang Lun, right? So now we have something that's like, okay, so this is more like uh, all the texts that may have been lost in history, but preserved in this text. So, uh, so later, uh, I think some other people say that this text may have inspired, part of the text may have inspired the writing of Shang Han Lun, or maybe it is this in parallel with it. But the compilation date is definitely later, like Tang Dynasty and early Song Dynasty. So that's claim number two. And claim number three is, uh, unfortunately, that's the, uh, that's uh, personally, I, I'm in the third camp, uh, in the, the skeptic tank, uh, camp. And I think the, the funniest thing is uh, before this podcast, uh, when Bro, uh, Mike told me that we are going to do Fu Xing Jiao. I was like, oh man, <laughs> we're, we're getting in trouble if, if we do this podcast. And then I was like doing some quick read up because I, I read a lot of uh, things regarding the textual issue regarding this before. But the funny thing is that the the the, the claim that attacks Fu Xing Jiao the most is actually written by this uh, guy, uh, Guo Shen, Guo Hong Shen or something. Uh, he He's actually not even in China. He's a, uh, I mean, he he got his uh, TCM training in China, but right now he's in New Zealand. Ah, uh, I re I read those articles. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so that, that article just destroyed the entirety of the work. It's like for terminal. Can we put a link. Is that in like Chinese or English? It's in Chinese. It's in okay. Chinese, but it's. Okay. Uh, I do look at some of his claims. Some claims are a little bit shaky, but a lot of claims are very legit questions. And yeah. So yeah. according to his attacks and also he's not the only one there are many out there who also attack the text if you actually look into wikipedia just look through the fushin Jue's chinese page the set cons common consensus there is that it's a forgery oh. so <laughs> yeah even wikipedia we wouldn't say wikipedia is, is unreliable but at the same time yeah. it's like the first thing you see is like it's a forgery <laughs> oh, that's funny so, 
So, um, so based on his claim is that this is a text made up by Zhang Da Chang's students because there are just so many issues with it, like the not just the transmission because the the transmission story is like weird, like they mm. they claim it's like yeah. a Mongol, but like it's but, never but recorded even how, in history. Yeah. Even how he came not, to not, get the not scroll Mongol from Dunhuang. Oh, oh, sorry, Dunhuang. from Dunhuang. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's from Dunhuang, and the the story just like. Uh, yeah, this Taoist guy stole it from the stash and then he gave it to this guy and this guy, uh, he memorized it and, and it was destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. So there's no manuscript, but somehow his disciple, everyone, uh, there are two main, main versions from his two students. And then uh, right. yeah. I think the last time they did it, they had 22 versions of it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. there's yeah. Quite, a, quite a few different work. Different. So, so, and they're all different. <laughs> they're all different. So, so there, there are just so many issues with it. And so transmission issues but, aside, then you look into the content, you're just like, there are a lot of terms that did not appear until Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty. Right. And also yeah. just like, if you claim it's by Tao Hongjin, and then Tao Hongjin never wrote anything like this. Like yeah. his writing style is different from Tao Hongjin. So <laughs> there are just so many issues. So this guy just attacked every single point to destroy yeah. this. Well, 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 let's oh. just look at this. Let's just talk about Tao Hongjin here because this is something that I find interesting. Let's let's su Tao Hong. Let's suppose Tao Hongjin did write it. Okay. The the reason why I have a big issue with this is that Tao Hongjin actually wrote two books about herbalism that we mm -hmm. still kind of have today, right? Yep. The Mingyi Bielu. Mm -hmm. And the Ben and the, is it just the Shenong Ben Sao Jing Zhu, or is it the G or the Zhu that the like the commentary on it? Right? Did, didn't he write a commentary on the Shenong Ben Sao Jing? Yeah. Well, uh, or was that disputed? That's, that's disputed. <laughs> disputed. Well, well, okay, but let's let's yeah, just but, say we have these two texts that but, arguably have more, uh, I guess, historical attribution to Tao Hong Jing. Mm -hmm. And there's not really any kind of mention of this style of medicine practiced in those yep. texts, is there? Mm -hmm. So that Correct. kind of, to me, kind of creates a little bit of a, of a problem as well, is that if you're going to, you know, write this one text would that clearly discusses, how do you say, like characteristics of herbs, classing them, allocating them in specific ways, would this not then make it into your commentary on these herbs as well mm -hmm. that you're writing about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like you, you could have mentioned it because it, it is so important because it's Tang Jingpa. After all, if it's a real deal, yeah. you would you would guard it with your life and make sure right. it, it survives the transmission. Yet it's not mentioned by any of his own works and also in his biography or like any historical writing, this text never existed. So- uh, That's the Fu Xing Zhui though, the Tang Yeah, Fu Xing Zhui, yeah. Tang Yijing did exist, but we're now just talking about the Fu Xing Zhui, just for yeah. you guys to be clarified, mm -hmm. which is the current, what would you say, scroll manuscript that is uh, being used today, just to yeah. let you mm -hmm. guys know. Yeah, and because, this... yeah, even Tang Yijing is like, even though many people we're make not sure that, that exists. Yeah, yeah <laughs> what we, we do know is, is this, because we, it actually appear in the Imperial Dialogue. We do know oh, yeah, a yeah. word called Tang Yijing exists. And then the second thing is, uh, uh, Feng Fu Mi say it is this, <laughs> but we know that he's he's not unreliable or whatever. But imperial catalog cannot be that wrong. So right. we do know a work called Tang Yijing exists, but the question is, we do not know what's inside. Right, right. Because it I mean, only appeared it... in one one copy of it, and and also it actually two copies of it. So in the Tang Dynasty, uh, I think Sui Dynasty imperial catalog, and also the uh, Han Shu. So in the first century, uh, in 78 CE, if I remember correctly. Mm. So in that one, we do have a Tang Yi Jingfa. Right. And in, right. In, in that text, we also have like the, I think it's the Huang Dei Nei Jing, the Huang Di Wai Jing. And I think, what is it? Is it the, maybe the Bian Chui, Bian yeah. Chui and, and the Wai, is it the something like the Bai Wai Shi. medicine? The Bai, the Bai the, Shi. like, Jingfa. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have quite a few kind of medical texts mm -hmm. recorded also, in there as well. It has all the different Jingfang works, uh, mm. close to 20 Jingfang works. Right. And Tang Jingfang is listed at the very end of it. And uh, so actually it brings out a little, a little bit of speculation of what it could be because it's right next to like contraindication of decoction and how to prepare fire and water, things like that. Mm. So maybe this is my personal speculation. Uh, I would say 
within a Han Shu, we did have a word called Tang Ye Jin Fa, but it's more like teaching you how to pr prepare like food, decoction, and water. Because in the Su Wen, I don't remember which chapter it is, it actually talks about different types of medicine. And in that one, you actually distinguish two types of medicine. One is Tang Ye, the other one is Du Yao. Is and that, today, that, Jin Fang, we practice is Du Yao. Du Yao means something that's harsh in nature, something that has a biased nature that can lead you to, to treat diseases. And, but Tang Ye seems to be something else entirely. So, do, so it, just it Du Yao, like you might translate as like, uh, like toxic or poisonous herbs, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Mm. I, I, I hate that translation, but uh, it's probably the you best translation we have. Yeah, uh, yeah. Du Yao, I, I feel like I, I personally I translate it as harsh medicinal. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's good. It, it has a bias to or inclined, right. strong inclined towards yeah. for for example something that's super drying like changzu right yeah. right yeah, yeah. Or, or something that's really hot like fuzi yeah so yeah. so we want we want to have herbs that has certain very strong nature to create change in our body i think that's a philosophy about du yao so, in, so can, in can we come back and maybe just talk about like a couple of other like little issues or maybe major issues of what has been used in the text that perhaps gives you warrant to think in this kind of skeptical nature so what what are some of these other kind of yeah issues that make you uh, skeptical in the fu xing jue in the fu xing jue right yeah in the fu xing jue well the first thing is uh the i think the most celebrated part of it the the tang ye jing fa is uh within the tang ye, tang ye jing within fu xing jue the most celebrated part with like 25 medicine divided according to the uh, elemental affinity i find it to be a little bit contrived mm. it's and also it's a system of medicine we didn't see until Song dynasty yep. or you can argue maybe late Tang dynasty but it's not it's not something out there before that time because yep. people do talk about five elements five phases blah 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 but we never really apply into herbal medicine until much 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 later and so so if we do have it, even as a medieval text, like Ma Qingxin suggested, and also Sabine uh, suggested, and that itself is already a leap in terms of med medical development. But most likely, it's probably based on later ideas. Uh, that would be my speculation, because later on, we do see a lot of uh, five element system in terms of herbalism. Like uh, the most famous uh, example, it would be Gao Gu Feng's uh, I think called ah. Yijia Xinfa. Uh, that's uh, written in the late 16th century. So basically, it he created a chart with 25 formulas that's based on the ideas of the five phases. And also, the in the Nanjing, it says if you are the metal phase and you got attacked by the other the other five, this is a bended evil. That is a uh, the straight evil, harsh evil. The the five types of evil he based off on the Nanjing five phases idea and counterbalance between the phases. Five phases, and, five evils. Yeah, five phases, five evil. So you have 25 formulas to treat treat them. Yeah. So that seems to be a main dynasty development. Well, and, well, actually, okay, let me throw this one at you. Uh, in one of Lee Dongyuan's work, he actually wrote about the five evils and each of those, and each and he gives a formula for each of those evils in them. In Lee the Dongyuan's work. Zhen Zhuji. I'm not, I'm not, I can't remember which Yeah, is, I think but, it's a Zhen Zhuji. But, yeah, but, but once again, it, it's like, uh, because I feel like from uh, Zhang Yuan-su, he began to explore that idea and Li dong yeah. did expand on that part. But at the time, they didn't really, it didn't become a system on its own. No, no. It's almost I, I, like a categorization that, that was taking place. Because it, I feel like it's always easy to categorize things in place. It's like, oh, this is fire, this is better, right. this is water, blah, blah, blah. But the, the trick is how do you make it into a dynamic part of it? How do you have the interaction? That would be a difficult part. Well, I'll, and, I'll say an interesting thing about mm -hmm. Gauss is that he actually has like pictorial, what would you say, like diagram mm -hmm. representation of how the formulas work yep. as in kind of like, you know, the, it has what you might say, like four kind of like, like a square and they're divided mm -hmm. into each kind of category of, of the phase of, you know, or oh, heart fire, you mm -hmm. know, and, and things like that. So he actually kind of divides it, which, you know, it, you could almost argue looks a little bit, you yeah. know, similar That's to like how the, the tongue is, the yeah. pushing tray, sorry, the pushing yeah. tray. And, 
but the the thing is just like like when we talk about like Fan Zhang Yunsu and Li Dongyuan, they didn't have that, and they yeah. were some of the brightest people back in that time, and they didn't have it. And it was then until Ming Dynasty they started to have those like you can say like elemental within or elemental interaction. Yeah. And so and, for me, it's highly questionable whether they then, already had that. And I think I think the thing that's important to point out is that I could almost like anticipate someone who is going to be like an apologist for mm -hmm. like the Fu Xingjie being like an early text thing to say, mm -hmm. well, well, hey, you know, like a uh, five element theory uh, was already very developed in the Huangdi Neijing and the Nanjing. Um, mm -hmm. So who is to say that, you know, this this kind of thing couldn't could have already been out there. And hey, mm -hmm. even if you look at the, the Shanghan Lun, you can see elements of uh, like five element organization there with the the mm -hmm. the, the gods right uh, yep. like we were talking about before Shenwu and Baihu and all this mm -hmm. um, arguably but, even in the Jin Gui intro as well mm -hmm. right and so you know how would you respond to that I mean for me I, I think I would just say that like you're saying just because the the structure was there doesn't mean that there was a system in place yeah. and you you would really want to see this like develop systems like this um to to be convinced um yeah. but, personally but... i would say that because um because five phases has been an idea in china since like 300 400 bce and throughout the time you you start to see like people begin to do more work at it so first of all uh it was more like the ideas almost like an ontological study they call it the five materials wu cai, not wu xi. was it was so, it not I thought even before, oh, okay, then does it come after to like the five, almost like, what would you say, conducts? Uh, Wuchang, that's later. Wuchang, well, no, that, I thought there was an excavated scroll called even by, by Wu Xing, which, which does talk about five conducts that may, so, maybe... First hey. off, the, the first idea it appeared in Zuo Zuan and Guo Yu, so that's like 300, 400 BCE. It was Wu Cai, five materials. Okay. So from that time period, you know, it's a study of ontological study. How do you divide up all the phenomena in the world you observe yeah. into different categories? So that aligns up with Zhou Yan's ideas quite well. Yep. And then during Zhou Yan's time, he elevated it to five phases and he used mm. it to explain how, besides the material aspect of it, how the five phases is like a driving force of history. So if you know more about five phases, you know it has a lot to do with astrology, basically the five planets from like Mercury, Mars, it, the, it, the five planets. Just to note, Mars, so, so Yan, yeah, mm -hmm. just to note, so Yan is seen as the founder of what is the, it, the, the Yin Yang school. school? Yeah, yeah, Yin Yang yeah. School. Mm -hmm. which is kind of obviously heavily influenced uh, yeah. our medicine. Mm. And so basically he uses the five phases to say, basically he says that's, what um, gives the monarch the right to rule, basically. It's like, why does the dynasty succeed one another? Because this monarch exemplifies this virtue with these stars in the, that place. So when it is during a time of fire, you need to have a fire virtue. And so that was a wild idea at the time, but, but based on uh, Sima Chen, or grand historians uh, in Han Dynasty, he's, uh, his commentary on that, he's like, well, his interest is not really ontology. He, his interest is more about um, how do you teach people to be virtuous? And he used that as a device to draw people's attention. Then he tells people to be virtuous. Anyway, so so basically, uh, I, I want to say that, yes, from the very on, people begin to categorize things into the five phases or five materials. So at first you have five materials, then you have the five energetics from the Shangshu, uh, the, the classic of documents. And also you have uh, people talk about virtues, colors, and everything got added in, uh, I would say late Warring State era and early uh, Western Han Dynasty. That's when you see all the different division of five in everything. And so uh, I think the most comprehensive list might be in the Bai Hu Tong De Lun, the White Tigers, uh, I don't even know how to translate. I think it's called a discussion or the conference of the White Tiger Pavilion. So oh. it's a first century work. And so in which they just have a gathering of all the Confucian and just discuss, what do you mean by five faces? I, I <laughs> like, think, what, I think what's the attribute of five faces? 
I think and, Hannah Fruhoff might have translated that. Yeah, he if did. We can find he, it. He, we'll, we'll, yeah, we can put that in the He translated one chat. chapter of it. He translated mm-hmm. uh, Qingxin, but he didn't translate uh, five places uh, chapter. Unfortunate. And so, so you know, from that time period, they are still onto this categorization point. And yep. it wasn't until the writing of Nanjing, because even if you look into the Nanjing, the writing of Nanjing, it does talk about five elements, but you don't see interactions. You see them in terms of categories. And a, so, little, a little bit. There are some chapters where it will say something like, you know, uh, mm-hmm. metal will cause, uh, what is it, wood to do something, water mm-hmm. will cause something to do that. I think that's in one of the Suwen chapters. But, the, but the it, is, ones, it is the great treatises. I, no, 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 no. This Not is another one. This is this, but th- that is purely just a controlling cycle. Yeah. But, but oh. I will say something very interesting is that the amount of times that metal turns up in the entire Neijing, I think, is something like seventeen. Yeah. Only sixteen or seventeen mm-hmm. times. Not very much. And mm-hmm. and and like you know, you have a like water and fire turn up a huge amount of time. Mm-hmm. But really, metal, and then I think even wood turns up not very much as well because i was quite interested to see how much mm-hmm. five phase was in these texts in the mm-hmm. Neijing, and it, it is not that much mm-hmm. not as much as you would think mm-hmm. yeah I, I feel like from my point of view is that um when the writing of Neijing took place some people argue western han i think it's early eastern han so when that took place um i feel like that's when five phases began to seep into medicine but it hasn't really become an integral system yet because it, when we get to the Nanjing, we see the huge integral system of the five phases in practice because that's when the five transfer points are assigned elemental affinity. And that's when you know how to treat diseases based on elemental balance and check and balance system. So, mm-hmm. so I feel like, yes, we can argue that as early as the writing of Nanjing, probably is first or second century CE, that's when we see five phases in terms of medicine but the question is that but it's applied to acupuncture it's not applied to herbal medicine and so later on uh, we do have writings from later on like uh, we do have writing from Chao uh, Yunfang so that Zhu Bing Yuan Hong Lun so uh, so it's That's called 7th uh, century? Uh, six, uh, early 7th century so it's like 610 CE so okay. that one is like top it's like uh, it talks about 2,000 diseases oh, and oh, their pathology yeah. and how do you treat it. It doesn't really talk in terms of five phases. And also we have uh, fragments of Xiaoping Fang. So that's like a... don't really see like the Nanjing system being applied mm. to herbal medicine and that appeared a lot much 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 mm. later and I feel like it didn't really become a system until mm, possibly Ming Dynasty or Qing Dynasty <laughs> to be honest well, well, uh, based on what mm. I read I haven't read every, everything yeah, but... Zhang Jingye himself was a big kind of proponent of the kind of phase within the phase person him- didn't he? Because he wrote that treatise in the um, which is it the uh, the Lei Jing Fu Yi or the Tui, where he talks about each kind of treatise on the five phases and them having a little bit of in in there. Well, yeah, I think it's based on the his commentary on uh, Lin Shu sixty four. I think yeah. Lin Shu sixty four is like the five element people and the with things. So yep. uh, I know some people really love that one. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna point out who. <laughs> and yeah, so, yep. but. <laughs> Since I'm like translating his uh, his com- his uh, uh, 180 formulas, he never once applied those <laughs> ideas into his his yeah. uh, formulas. So yeah. I, I would just say, even for someone like Zhang Jue who wrote a lot about this idea and also leading to e uh, the illustrated wings of the categorized canon, mm-hmm. even he didn't apply it. So mm-hmm. that, so that so for me it's like yes, the idea of five faces did exist the conceptual model is there but how do you put into question that that is a and for me the earliest text i can see is uh Gao Gufeng, but his text yeah. is not that, that popular to be honest like uh, mm. if you ask people uh, who Gao Gufeng is most people will give you like a blank guy is like who who 
Kau kau kau. The 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 only reason that I actually found out about him was because as I was translating the explanations of channels and points,、mm-hmm. it has like a lung disease of the lung, heart disease of the lung. Right. And I asked I asked Leo, hey Leo, what does this?、Oh, Leo locked that is. I asked Leo, lock, what does this mean? And he goes, oh. You know, this is this idea of the five evils, and look at this text. This is a prominent idea. So I actually only knew about that text because、uh, Leo Locke told me about it.、Mm-hmm. And when so, was that? When was that text? When did that come out? Seventeenth, seventeenth century, something. I、like、think seventeenth century. Yeah. 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 And I, I feel like the five phases and the window chi, the five movement six chi, didn't really、mm. become a system until. Ming and Qing Dynasty, like、uh, with word like Gao Kufeng, and or even with word like Huang Yunyu, he's like the five moon and six chi school. That's like super prominent out here. You mean in terms of herbalism, right? Yeah, herbalism. Yeah, yeah. Because with acupuncture, yes, you can argue like Nanjin pushes for it as early as like、yeah. second century. You you can definitely say that for sure. Even、yes. even chrono acupuncture, maybe in what eleventh or twelfth century, is it might use a bit of that Wu Yunyu Qi idea. But was that more just the stems and branches, not so similar?、Mm, that one, that one is a、right. little bit tricky. Let,、um, let, let's skip that question. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to bring something in. I want to bring something in. Okay. Because... So, so we've been talking about the text a little bit, but what? What? Can we? What are some positives of this text? Regardless of if you're skeptical or not, what? 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 Parts of the text. What, what Alan or Will would do? You want to chime in on this? So、uh, let me talk about one formula and one mentality issue. So one formula is,、uh, I think it's in Dan Tang, Dan Yi Dan Tang. So so basically, we know the Shao Sai Hu Tang.、Um, uh, if you prescribe before over a long period of time, you can destroy someone's liver, and we do have that event happen in Japan.、Uh, they have the Uh, the Shao Sai Hu Tang event,、uh, where like they have hundreds of victims, like with damaged liver function, after they took it for years, without prescription. Because in Japan, you can actually go to a grocery store and get those, those Kempo formula just off the shelf. And some people take it. They say, "Well, you can use it to treat stress. You can use it to treat everything." So、right. people took、it's、it forever. Like, it's like chocolate, hey. <laughs> so <laughs> so when I look into In Dan Tang, I'm just like, "Hey, that one is special. It has a Shao Yao in that." Mm. And not just ingenious, and I just like so. Usually, if I prescribe Shao Cai Hu Tang for a prolonged period of time to or to to patients who are a little bit weaker, I typically add the、uh, I would definitely add Bai Shao or sometimes use Dan Gui. Based on the presentation, I would definitely think about adding something in in just to ensure the safety. So there are bits and pieces of that those little addition, though this is little tweak that、uh, I feel like. That's quite involved to inform our practice.、Uh, the other thing,、uh, while、well, this might be a big topic, is like we can always bring you back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like、uh, why, like what, what it makes me because when I when Mike told me that we are doing fusion jail, I was like one question I asked within myself is like, what is my relationship to the books? Like, why do I want it to be real or not real? And I think it's a it's a big question we need to ask ourselves. Is that sometimes we want to see、um, a book is written by this great guy or some someone is infallible, and we can just follow the footstep and make sure everything is a smooth ride. So maybe that's the case, or maybe some people just want to say everyone think this is has been tested throughout history, so it's quite reliable. I want to follow. I, I don't know. So. Yes, this morning I was thinking about this. I was like,、uh, because I went through something quite similar in my in terms of my study in Buddhism. So when I first studied Buddhism, I just read about everything. But but then I went through one phase of my study called I call it the Hinayana phase. Hinayana、yeah. means the the slow vehicle phase. It it means、mm. at the time I say, I I would only read the Agama. I would only read the Nikaya. Everything else is bullshit. <laughs> everything else is not written by the Buddha. Buddha never say any of this. Everything else is BS, and I don't even trust the Agama from Chinese version. I say, wow,、well, the translation sucked, and、uh, people adding in all the things. I don't trust it. So I only study the Theravada uh, uh, Nikayas. But 
after I studied for a while, I realized one thing is that even the Nikaya from the Theravada side has its issues. Mm. Due to political pressure, uh, we do know some parts got removed. And so we only see the school of one thing. And that's when things begin to open out to me. It's like, it's not, yes, we want to study the original flavor to understand what the founder of the, of the lineage or of the philosophy, what they stand for. But at the same time, we cannot really reject later writings. Just, mm. just because it's not something mentioned by the Buddha, it doesn't mean it's mm. worthless. So let's go back to this point. Um, 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 on uh, Fu Xinjie is that it's a tiny, it's pretty much impossible that uh, Fu Xinjie, the, the Tang Yijinfa within Fu Xinjie was written by Yi because, well, Yi lived like 3,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't even have text from the Oracle text that, that line up with this or the, any concept that, so he definitely did not write this. And right. maybe in medieval time people did it, cool. And Maybe Mark is a modern portrait, but it does not deny that it is it could still be useful in the clinic. So, so I feel like this is a um, sometimes when we talk about Fushinjia, we always fall into this tribalistic mentality. Is that you are either for it or you're against it. You're, when you're for it, it's like yeah, this is the best thing ever. We need to study this to inform our study of Shanghai Nun. Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, it's always good to learn, you know? Right. <laughs> so I, I'm not against that, but at the same time, you then you are pressing on others and say, yeah, we alone hold this authentic, genuine text. For me, that, that becomes questionable. Yeah. And, but the other, the other end say, oh, this is a uh, modern portrait. It's useless. It's worthless. We should not even take a look at it. I am against that too, because I, I feel like uh, it's like, uh, you know, there's a Guilin Guban, the Guilin copy of Shanghai Lun. Everyone yeah. knows the forgery, but it's super yeah. useful. Yeah, mm. right. So, right. I mean, yeah, everyone <laughs> in Taiwan swears by it. So, so <laughs> for me, it's like it's fine to be a forgery, but mm. just sometimes just don't make it bigger than it is. I, I still think it's a quite valuable text, and I do think people can uh, become inspired by it and learn from it. For me, a couple of aspects that I find really interesting is that its ability to bring together a lot of ideas in that it brings together this idea of ti yong or kind of function and form it arguably brings together quotes from the huang de nie jing into kind of like formulas that were very very close to or if not this identical to the shang han lun it brings in some very interesting ideas of five element of phase kind of dynamics as well it, and it also makes you think about yin yang in terms of the kind of what do you call it the celestial movement formulas as well mm -hmm. so i think to me you know there's still a lot of very very interesting ideas at play in this text mm -hmm. and whether or not it's a forgery or not i i think that that's a it's a really cool discussion that we've had, but I still think, in my opinion, in, in understanding Chinese medicine and philosophy and these kinds of ideas, there's a lot in it to unpack. And the person, whoever wrote it, you know, I think was an incredibly smart and mm -hmm. astute individual to be able to create this kind of text and this system within what was already there and just have it, have it work. And, and it, it reads pretty damn good in my opinion, you know. Sure, some things feel a little bit forced, but it's still it's still an incredible work. And I would you know, I would have loved, you know, we'll never know if it's if it's legit or not, you know, but it would have been amazing to see if the person who wrote this, did they write anything else or anything else like that, you know, how did they, how did they come up with this idea? It's uh, right. Yeah. So so I you know, I I think I think definitely anyone who's who's read the Shanghai Lun and is interested in this kind of idea it should definitely read the uh, read the text mm -hmm. you know and just just because i think it will it will and, or anyone interested in chinese medicine and five phases i think it can really broaden your knowledge and understanding of of ideas in it yeah even if you hate it i mean you can write your own version of <laughs> i feel like it's a very good intellectual exercise to put it into this such a model you know it's yeah. i mean as much as i question it's uh Validity, but <laughs> at the same time, I find it to be really fascinating because it's you. You gotta be have so much knowledge about herbal medicine to create something like this. It gives you a sense of uh, the directionality of herbs, right? 
because of the use of five phases. And so in that way, it's a little bit similar to um, Huang Yuan Yu and the way that Huang Yuan Yu looks at um, herbalism and in the way that he, because he arguably kind of created his own understanding of, of the, the Shang Han Lun as well. And it, it was uh, completely based upon, well, it's based upon uh, five element to a degree, and then also uh, channels and also uh, six, mm. the, the six yun. Um, and so I think this, the getting like a, a this idea of directionality is really, really, uh, really, really powerful when we're starting to learn um, Song Han Lun. That being said, I think it can actually also be limiting. Um, but I think when you're when you're first starting, it's it's a great tool. I'm studying a yeah. whole system right now that's also um, like a Shang Han Lun, and it's it's based on directionality, and it, it just, yeah it just really helps you uh, think about the formulas um, and integrate uh, sort of diagnostics um, and uh, treatments into like a kind of a streamlined system. So mm -hmm. yeah, I myself I don't have that much uh, like knowledge of. Um, the the Fu Xing Jia, but I cer certain things in it um, really excite me, and I, I I do hope to to study it more in the future. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I think that about rounds up our discussion today. To say thank you for listening, thank you, Alan, for coming on and and sharing so much of your knowledge with us. I think we're going to have to bring you back on not once, not twice, but several times. And <laughs> whenever we can, whenever we can, can bring you on, I think it's uh, it's great to 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 talk to you because we you know we we we've both had our private discussions with you when we were developing and writing our books. So I think yeah. it's really nice to be able to bring you to a wider audience and let other people just you know hear how much you know and how valuable your knowledge is. So thank you. Um, and no, no problem. I'm just and also, also uh, to, in case anyone's still listening at this point, uh, what like what? <laughs> when is the the book coming out? You have another uh, translation of uh, Zhang Junya coming out, right? Oh dear God, I don't know. I, th I think what spring, March hopefully. next year, March something like that. Hopefully next spring. Hopefully, what what can you there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll put the links and stuff, and we yeah you know, we'll have a lot of. Uh, post podcast work to do here to 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 um send get some links together for everyone um but that that brings it to a close i think we're down to less than one minute here and um thank you everyone for listening and tune in next time see you later round time <laughs> <laughs>